Uh, so, hey everyone, uh, I'm Atif. Uh, I'm a data consultant from ThoughtWorks uh, with more than 10 years of experience uh, you know, into uh, building some of these distributed systems. Uh, and I've also been working in the big data space for the last five years. Um, outside of work, I have interests in security, open source, and DevOps. Um, this talk is primarily going to uh, be uh, what it has been my experience with uh, in the industry with when it comes to data governance and strategies that uh, a lot of uh, big organizations take up and uh, just talk about how they fare, what are the strategies that they take and what are the challenges that they face uh, when it comes to uh, data governance. Um, so before we start, uh, I'd just like to call out that data that uh, we had earlier in the 2000s or the early 90s uh, was very different. The landscape was that you typically would have a, a MySQL database or an Oracle database or uh, one of these databases. And what you would typically do is like you would have tables on those databases and the role of governance uh, uh, in that time was to have like or be aware of all of the tables uh, that exist in a single data warehouse or in multiple data warehouses, um, along with uh, all of the different fields and their types. And this used to be really enough uh, uh, for a majority of the organization. So as long as you had ACLs uh, and role-based access control on your uh, databases and you had uh, some definition of what the columns meant and what the tables were doing, most organizations were fairly comfortable uh, with just having that as their entire data governance strategy. However, if we look at uh, the data landscape now, uh, it has exploded to a large extent. So there are like a variety of tools and technologies that exist. Uh, and a lot of organizations uh, are not just using like any one of these tools, but they tend to um, use a variety of these tools. So uh, this is what a typical landscape look, looks like. And ideally, most of the organizations are using one of these tools in every category. So you probably have some uh, BI tool, you have some um, tool for uh, data processing, a different tool for data ingestion, and um, uh, multiple different tools to do data science and to do visualizations and so on. In addition to that, uh, we also have like the complexity of many of uh, the organizations now moving to the cloud. Um, and it is a huge challenge, particularly in terms of security and infrastructure. Once you move to the cloud, what many organizations quickly realize is that the complexity explodes because now they have to manage all of the end different services that connect together and form um, what was a single hosted platform earlier. Um, and in addition to all of these things, there is also the complexity in terms of the data itself. Uh, so whereas earlier we just had uh, data that was mostly sitting in tables or uh, uh, databases or data warehouses that dealt with only one particular type of data, you now have uh, data uh, types that are like vastly different. So you, uh, you have like these very different uh, structured data formats, and then you also have semi-structured and unstructured data. Uh, and it like constitutes the entire gamut of data that you can imagine. So log files, um, text files, images, video, metadata, uh, so on, right? So given all of these th uh, things, uh, given all of the complexity, uh, a lot of organizations uh, have in the past failed to come up with a good data governance strategy. And in essence, this uh, has led to a, a lot of other side effects of not having a data governance strategy in, uh, in place. Uh, so things like not being aware of the data that sits on, on their systems, not being aware of who the owner of the data is, not being aware of uh, like sure data quality is a problem, but even when it comes to security, many organizations are not aware of uh, what is the data that they, they have of their customers and how that data is being used, how that data is being curated, stored, who is responsible for that data. 
and what are the different laws and compliances that go with it. Uh, so over the years, to tackle some of these challenges, uh, there have been many laws that have also come up uh, to tighten uh, the security uh, and the data privacy concerns uh, with regards to the various breaches and leaks that have happened. Uh, so you have like PDP, GDPR, HIPAA, uh, PCI, DSS, CCPA, and all of these different laws that have come into place. And like I'd say that even though organizations are not very mature, like they have been there uh, for the last five or six years. Um, so you would expect some sort of maturity and you would expect uh, these organizations to fare slightly better. But if you look at the metrics uh, and like we really can't look into the internals of these different organizations to assess them on uh, things like quality and some of the other aspects of governance, but security is something that uh, puts out uh, the data governance frameworks and strategies that these organizations have in place in very public view. So if you look at it from um, uh, last year, uh, so typically most of the organizations uh, are still like uh, prone to data breaches. Uh, they have like suffered damages in average of US, uh, like three to 4 million uh, US dollars. Uh, time to identify a data breach. And this is one of the major ones. Like on average, it is 279 days. Uh, and the average worst time by industry is one year when it comes to healthcare. So what this typically means is, uh, although like it, it's, uh, although like, these organizations may not have like good security, but what this also goes to show is that a lot of these organizations don't have a very clear or good data governance framework in place to even comprehend the data, the uh, policies that they should put in place, the compliances if they're meeting them, and uh, the ability to understand if, uh, if there are security lapses or uh, issues in their uh, ecosystem. So why is that? Like, what, what is it that these organizations are missing out uh, when it comes to having like a, a big, uh, when it comes to having a data governance framework? So is it just like the security aspect? Uh, well, it's more beyond that. So without like a good data governance framework, uh, framework. Most of these organizations are missing out on multiple other uh, capabilities and abilities that can improve uh, the overall functioning of the organization and drive growth. So they tend to miss out on, of course, like being able to track data sets across organizations. Um, they tend to uh, fail, you know, when it comes to creating data ownership and accountability of the data that they're uh, generating. Um, there is also often like an issue of data quality. Uh, most of the organizations uh, are realizing it now that uh, the data that they have, even if they ingest all of it, if it's of uh, it's it, it's if it's not of good quality, it will often give them the wrong insights and be, uh, lead to the wrong business decisions, um, which isn't always great. Uh, they of course. In addition to doing this, they fail to improve productivity for their own teams. Uh, they fail to uh, reduce friction between teams. So without a good framework, like these teams won't come to know uh, about the data that, that sits on the system. Most of the times they end up building uh, redundant processes. Uh, and they also fail to have processes in place to get access to the data, even uh, when it comes to inter uh, the internal uh, organization itself. Um, so a lot of large enterprises really uh, face like a majority of these issues. There are more, but these are some of the major ones that like I've seen at least. So in essence, like without these capabilities, most of these organizations, uh, like it has a very direct impact on how they can scale and uh, how they can grow um, as they become larger and larger, both in terms of like the data, but also in terms of like organization growth, in terms of maturity and in terms of people and skill uh, that are available in the organization. So let's look at like, what are the challenges to solve when it comes to uh, typical data governance, right? So of course, like uh, one of the very clear things that a lot of organizations are starting to realize now is the need for cataloging. Um, 
there is also a need for lineage, uh, which is uh, which is which are not a lot of organizations have in place at the moment is what I've realized. Uh, but like lineage gives you the ability to track how your data is being curated and is especially useful if you have very large ETL pipelines and uh, data flow that uh, data flow between multiple hops and multiple nodes in the system. Um, tagging and classification. Um, so a lot of organizations are doing this to some degree, um, trying to make sense of the data sets that they're curating, but the tagging and classification frameworks are not really mature in my opinion. So uh, typically you want to classify things as like the domain of the data that you know, you're curating things like who is the owner of the data, uh, what is the sensitivity level of the data, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, besides these three, there is also the concern of having uh, or enforcing security and policy control over all of your data sets. Um, having, having the ability to validate if you're in compliance through audit and by, uh, by this ability, like ideally, what I mean is that you should uh, be at, uh, you should be at a place where you have like semi automated um, controls in place that give you uh, this ability out of the box uh, and the ability to do this in a repeated fashion. Um, a lot of organizations use GDPR and uh, these various different laws uh, as a driver to their data governance framework, but there isn't a very clear understanding uh, when it comes to what it means to be uh, compliant with these laws. Um, and there are also like these second or third level concerns, which in my opinion are very important, but I, uh, like I've rarely seen uh, them being given importance. So things like uh, business glossary, uh, which is the ability to like uh, give description to all of your data sets uh, and the ability to rationalize uh, and uh, like ability to rationalize it further and build on top of what you already have. And also the ability to have custom meta types. Um, so in this example, uh, you know, uh, for say like a custom meta type sort of models the way in uh, the various different ways in, in which an organization thinks about uh, its data. So for example, like if you're on, uh, if you're following a data product paradigm where you, uh, where different teams are curating data products, you would want to model um, a custom meta type which has that sort of, uh, which gives you that language to describe and uh, proliferate uh, that understanding throughout the organization. Um, and of course, uh, the ability to also um, visualize uh, like your very large AI ML ETL pipeline. So this is often uh, the case where in organizations, there's a lot of complex uh, AI ML and uh, AI ML uh, ETL uh, pipelines and jobs that uh, nobody understands uh, to the full degree, right? So uh, having this in a catalog often gives you that ability to have it, to visualize it and see it uh, you know, in front of you and be able to understand it better. Uh, and like it also gives you the ability to see how your jobs are set up, how they're triggered and be able to optimize the overall flow, which may uh, uh, sit between like multiple teams. So given uh, that there are these challenges to solve, uh, a lot of organizations, uh, in a lot of organizations, this is the typical architecture or setup that you will see. Um, and like a key takeaway of this, uh, is that there is no one tool that does every job. Uh, for a lot of these uh, organizations, uh, you will see a lot of different tools being used across for a lot of different functions. Uh, and even among these different functions, there are multiple alternatives. Uh, so you saw, from what you saw in, in those images that I showed you earlier, these were the set of tools that I uh, that I sort of covered, but there are many, many more uh, open source tools uh, that sort of tackle uh, the various different layers of data governance. Uh, so there is like this notion of um, complexity when it comes to, to the tools and the architecture. Uh, but what a lot of people don't realize is there is a lot of complexity when it comes to the organizational structure as well. 
So you typically, uh, with a framework like this, uh, if you have a large data organization, you will typically have all of these various different roles. Um, and it is very crucial for all of these different roles to function in the best way possible, to have minimum friction and to be aligned and to be aware of the data governance framework uh, that you put together for them. Because ultimately, like they are the customers that you're serving uh, and they are the key people who are going to be using and um, creating, um, uh, you know, or rather partaking in the creation of your data governance strategy. So if we look at all of this, uh, so far we have talked about what are the challenges, the technical challenges, and what are the technical complexities? Uh, but let's look at how the organizations fare right now and what are the business motivations why the industry hasn't really caught on. So if you look at like uh, what most of the where most of the organizations are today, uh, there is very low maturity except when it comes to these very large organizations like Netflix, Amazon, Google. Uh, the industry is like definitely catching on. Um, most of the enterprises have started to realize this need. Uh, but right now there is also a lot of hype uh, around data governance and most of it is uh, comes from a security and a GDPR perspective. Um, additionally, a lot of large enterprises have also like completed or initiated their move to uh, but what what they have failed to realize is that they do not have the right governance in, in place to be able to tackle that complexity. Uh, these organizations don't often understand what is uh, like, what are the different sensitivity levels of the data, how they should be uh, curating the data, how should be, should they be securing it? What is the, uh, what are the needs uh, in order to be able to comprehend uh, these data systems? And in addition to that, uh, like from what I've seen, a lot of organizations are trying to drive for anonymization frameworks where uh, they want to be able to put or segregate a particular type of data and uh, just be able to say, hey, this data is sensitive and this data is not sensitive. But the anonymization frameworks are limited to uh, ju just to doing like th those very simple things of just like, hey, let me put this in a separate, like for example, a separate S3 bucket. And people don't really think about what it means to really anonymize and secure that anonymized data. So nobody thinks about, uh, people think about the access to the anonymized data, but not about um, infrastructure, not about people who are using that data, so on and so forth. So why is this the case? Why? why are organizations not able to fare well uh, and why do they have these different problems? So in my opinion, these problems are a result of uh, these three broad categories of failures uh, that I've seen. And most often like uh, organizations have at least one or uh, all of these uh, uh, categories, you know, apply to them. Uh, and I've tried to cover like uh, only the, key um, key issues that I've seen. So if, if we talk about strategy, one of the key issues that I've seen is like people still hold on to um, a very old way of thinking about data. So uh, the first slide that, uh, that I spoke about where uh, I spoke about how data warehouses had, uh, were doing data governance, that is still the case. Like when a lot of orgs think about data, they think of it as uh, being able to slap some role-based access controls on a table somewhere and call it a day, right? But that is that is not uh, enough in today's uh, world. Um, in addition to that, they often also uh, end up thinking about like the tools and um, tech stack that they need, but they fail to think about how they're going to change the organization and, and the culture that's within the organization. Um, they fail to articulate the business value of these systems internally. So often they don't understand these systems uh, internally themselves. And even if they do, they, uh, they often fail to articulate value to other business stakeholders and get proper funding to 
to, to be able to move forward with a data governance strategy. And it's often very hard because uh, most of uh, like you're only most of the organizations are only able to rationalize uh, things when it comes to data security. But what they don't realize is all of these other frameworks, uh, all of these other uh, capabilities and features of a good data governance framework also define um, how quickly they can uh, build and how quickly they can mature as an organization. Uh, right. So it's a very abstract thought, uh, in my opinion, and not a lot of people uh, have that aha moment where they realize like this is uh, something that will help them uh, go along with. And lastly, like most of the organizations are looking for a one stop solution to this, which in my opinion is not going to happen. Uh, the other issues are like that I've seen is, of course, uh, making it all about compliance, uh, letting um, all of the governance being driven just from a security perspective and thinking just about GDPR and security and not focusing on all of those other aspects of uh, data governance that I spoke about, not focusing on data quality, not focusing on things that make it easier uh, to rationalize about uh, the data in, in the organization. Um, and also like when they start out, like because the tooling is not very mature, there is, there are a large amount of tools that they have to deal with and they often end up, uh, uh, spreading the security mechanisms across like a multitude of tools and, uh, not having a single, uh, holistic view of, uh, of, uh, security and audit, uh, auditability in place. And lastly, getting a vendor to fix your compliance problem. So this is the most common thing that I've seen. Like while it's okay to uh, bring in someone who has the expertise, uh, what organizations fail to understand is nobody is going to uh, be able to give them a customized solution unless they are also involved in uh, building the data governance strategy. So you need to work together with, with your vendor and not, um, expect them to do the job on their own and, you know, be able to expect something good, uh, come out of it. And lastly, uh, when it comes to the implementation and tech challenges, we've already spoken a lot about it. Uh, but some of the other key issues that I see is, uh, of course, like in terms of onboarding the different teams to sort of understand why data governance is important. A lot of times people just mandate it. Um, uh, and that makes, uh, these different teams lose interest, uh, create a lot of friction and ultimately the business decides not to go with a governance strategy. Um, there is also, um, uh, a lack of skill maturity in, in the industry when it comes to data governance frameworks. Uh, so a lot of people are starting to talk more about it, but I think it still has a lot of way to go before it can mature. So given all of these uh, challenges and given all of these issues that we've seen, what is, what would, what is a good way to go about building a data governance strategy then? Um, so if you ask me, I think there is no perfect one data governance strategy. What is important to understand is that it, uh, like you won't be able to achieve good data governance, uh, from day one, like within a year or within a two year, which is often like the target, you know, when, when it comes to these large organizations, they will put out a certain budget and, um, and like, you need to get a data governance strategy done in within that budget and then like call it a day. But that's not how data governance works. What is important is for you to understand that a lot of, uh, like that it is a, it is a journey, uh, where you should incrementally build it out, uh, to avoid as much business loss as possible when it comes to just building the tooling and also to better understand, um, what is the right uh, strategy that should apply to you. So day one, you're not going to be able to understand the right strategy. Uh, you may have some requirements in place, but from what I've seen is those requirements often don't hold true once you're six months or eight months into building frameworks like these. So in my opinion, a good way to start with this is just to, to be able to put a very lean framework together in, in the, uh, in the first, uh, few, uh, phases of putting your data governance strategy, 
So what I would recommend is um, have a discover phase, uh, which is the very initial phase when you start out. And uh, what you should aim for uh, is to introduce governance as a byproduct of tooling. So you should build tools and give them to teams. Uh, and as a byproduct of, for example, using those tools, uh, the, uh, you know, you should be able to get the metadata or the data that, that you need. So for example, if you're using Spark, then maybe try to build a Spark connector uh, that helps uh, the various different teams in writing data to whatever location that they want to write to, but also, um, also curates the data onto, um, on, onto uh, whatever catalog you're using, for example. Um, so instead of mandating, what you need to do is in the first phase, uh, not get in the way of the various different teams trying to achieve their business goals, but give them a very easy way of integrating with whatever solution you're trying to build. Uh, it is also, from what I've seen, useful to uh, follow a pull-based model and just discover these data sets. So if, for example, you know uh, the various different S3 buckets where people will put their uh, data, what you can do is just crawl these S3 buckets every day and get all of the metadata uh, um, of the data sets. And that will give you a good understanding of uh, the data landscape that you have. Uh, before you try to build uh, systems that sort of uh, build the next level of systems really. So once you have like a sense of your data landscape, uh, what is often useful is to start introducing compliance and audit. Um, so typically what you will need, uh, you will do is like, you should have like a separate data governance organization, um, which tries to tackle this problem of understanding what are the very basic minimum criteria of security uh, uh, security audit, uh, data quality, and things like these uh, that should be enforced across the organization. Uh, have them in, um, formulate these rules. And while they're formulate, formulating these rules, uh, you continue to build your uh, governance framework. Uh, ideally, a central catalog is what works best uh, in this phase. Uh, and it is in this phase, in my opinion, where you should start moving towards a push-based approach where you have the producers of data curating all of this uh, information into your governance framework. So uh, people who are like, producing this data should be pushing things like, uh, what is the data quality of the data sets that they're curating? Um, what is the sensitivity levels of the different data sets that they're curating? And you should start mandating this uh, across the organization. So as an outcome, what you would expect is uh, some enforced basic governance and security in place. Uh, and additionally, what is also useful if you can is build like an automated audit system, something that runs in a CD pipeline, for example, that uh, way, uh, where you get like automated reports of all of your uh, compliance uh, and security uh, and infrastructure uh, you know, in a, in a single location, if, if possible. Uh, and, and once you're done with these stepping stones, like that is when you should focus for the last and final phase of like building this, uh, data catalog. And this is like a never ending phase. Okay. So, uh, ideally what you want to do is once you have like a good understanding of your landscape and once you've identified what are the policies that should apply and the minimum security level, you should start federating this responsibility into different teams. So this, uh, the compliance and audit team should ideally spread out, uh, become part of these different um, distributed uh, catalog, uh, sorry, distributed uh, data teams, uh, which are responsible for their own data. So, uh, so there's a data steward and a data governance individual in each of these teams driving these requirements uh, from at a team level and not at us uh, as a central sort of enforcement directorate. Um, so, yeah, and, and why this is important is often like when you scale out, when you scale, start scaling beyond two or three different teams, it becomes uh, very hard to 
be able to rationalize about the different tech stacks that these different teams are using, be able to understand how different teams are using these data sets uh, and be able to understand the context of the data, like the, uh, uh, the domain of the data itself. Um, and that is where it's useful to, for these individuals to be working with directly with the teams rather than uh, chalking things out as a separate uh, entity altogether. Um, and ideally, like if possible, what uh, what we should also start doing in this phase is like if we can sort of distribute the catalog uh, itself, uh, and although have like a central catalog, but dis uh, distribute the data uh, ingestion and curation ability to multiple different teams, and these different catalogs curate the data further to a central catalog. Uh, in, in my opinion that is the ideal state given the current uh, given the current uh, complexities that are there in the data world uh, now in terms of tooling the tooling is not necessarily as mature when it comes to uh, achieving some of these uh, ideas however there are frameworks and open source uh, frameworks that have come come into uh, play in the last one or two years um, for example, Egeria uh, is a really good example of uh, one of these frameworks um, where people have started talking about it and started realizing this as a key idea to be able to uh, for to be able to enable really uh, quick growth uh, within organization uh, organizations when it comes to data and and teams. Right. Um, so. This was it. Th thanks a lot for um, attending the talk. Uh, I'll leave you with some of the uh, useful links that I used to curate some of the material uh, in these talks uh, and read up more about, um, about these tools and about the open source frameworks uh, that are coming up. Thank you, Atif. That was really great. Um, do you have any updates you would like to share with us on data governance strategies? Any comments? Hey, thanks, Anvesha. So yeah, definitely. I, I think uh, ever since the talk happened for the first time, like one of the things that I've heard a lot about is like uh, th these aspects of data uh, governance and federation. You know, these ideas have caught on. Um, in the last one, one and a half years. Personally, I see a lot of people trying to do it, but failing due to like the reasons uh, that we spoke about. Uh, there has been some progress in terms of tooling. Um, so there are a lot of frameworks that have come up. Uh, the challenge still remains, however, that they're very specific to the platform. For example, uh, you know, Databricks has come out with Delta sharing uh, and then AWS also has a uh, lake house, uh, which is really, really good. If you're on, if all of your tooling is on AWS or all of your tooling is on uh, Databricks. However, uh, generally what I've seen is like people uh, use a mix or a variety of clouds tooling um, and, you know, different technologies. And yeah, it, all, all of the current tooling currently fails to, uh, you know, enable this shared global uh, application of uh, standards and policies. Um, so, so that's been like a interesting sort of, a, uh, you know, an interesting progress that has happened in this space. Uh, the other, uh, uh, the other set of things that, you know, have caught on in the, uh, in the last few uh, months uh, is this um, idea of a data mesh, uh, which, you know, I've invited my colleagues, uh, Sumeda and uh, Vanya to talk about and discuss alongside me. Uh, but essentially, uh, it is this idea of how do you bake in governance as part of your tooling? Uh, and how do you enable teams to be self-service? Like, how do you enable them to do uh, uh, federation and be enable them to be independent, uh, you know, um, and not uh, rely on like a central body that approves all of the data and all of the actions that they do with that data. Um, yeah, so 
yeah, that's been some of the updates that have happened in this space.